counseling psychologist at AFS executive at its partner. A counseling psychologist is AFF's executive director, who is the founder, editor, the founder, editor of Cultic Studies Journal, the editor of CSG's successor, Cultic Studies Review, and editor of Recovery from Cults. He is co-author of Cults, What Parents Should Know, and Satanism, and a cult related by violence, What You Should Know. Dr. Lagoni has spoken and written wildly, widely about cults. Wildly. I'm going to leave now. I go on. In, in 1945, he received the Leo J. Leo J. Ryan Award from the Original Cult Awareness Network and was honored as the Albert P. Danielson Visiting Scholar at Boston University. It, it's my pleasure to introduce you to him. Okay. I'm, I'm back, I'm sorry. <laughs> also speaking is Patrick Ryan, a former member of Transcendental Meditation. He has been a thought reform consultant since 1984. He designs and implements AFF's internet website. Mr. Ryan is the founder and former head of TMX, the organization of ex-members of TM. He has contributed to AFF's book, Recovery from Cults, and has presented programs about hypnosis and trance induction techniques at several AFF workshops and conferences. Also speaking is Joseph F. Kelly, a thought reform consultant since 1988. He spent 14 years in two different Eastern meditation groups. He has lectured extensively on cult-related topics and is co-author of Ethical Standards for Thought Reform Consultants, published in AFS Cultic Studies Journal. It's my very great pleasure to introduce you to the whole. I'll try not to speak wildly. <laughs> the compact condition of the Arts Fit English Dictionary of the Bible defines conversion as the action of converting or fact of being converted to some opinion, belief, body, etc. This definition makes a useful distinction between converting and being converted, what I've sometimes referred to as intergenerated and outergenerated conversions. We typically associate conversions to cultic groups as outergenerated. That is, as being in large part the product of manipulation and deception. But not all conversions are manipulated, not even all cultic conversions. As the Blockies pointed out, what many of us would call cultic environments are characterized more by the difficulty people have getting out than by the diverse ways in which they get in. Hence, conversion to cultic groups cannot always be explained by theories of manipulation. We need other models that take into account factors of manipulation, but are not limited by them. In this brief paper, I will propose another way of looking at conversion. What I will discuss does not rise to the level of being a theory. Uh, I hope, however, that it points the way toward a more useful theory than those we currently have. By definition, all conversions, manipulated and non-manipulated, presume that one's way of viewing and relating to the world has changed in some fundamental way. I don't hear use the term to refer to changes of religion, for instance, that are made for uh, marital harmony, and people will convert from uh, Christianity to Judaism, for example, or vice versa, for marital harmony, not necessarily because of deep conviction. I'm talking here about genuine conversions that really represent a change. <laughs> the world has changed since telephones around. <laughs> uh, it, what accounts for such dramatic change? And the fact is nobody really knows. There are many theories of conversion. Indeed, each of the disciplines that study conversion, psychology, theology, and sociology, embraces many competing theories. 
I prefer and will here discuss a cognitive psychological approach which assumes that human beings tend toward logical consistency in their beliefs and behaviors. I say tend toward because only a fool would deny that we human beings are nearly so logical as we like to think we are. Indeed, one of the more widely respected psychological theories, the theory of cognitive dissonance, addresses the ways in which people resolve inconsistencies between and among their beliefs and behaviors. Nevertheless, that we are bothered by logical consistencies testifies to our tendency to seek logical consistency. We're not totally stupid. Uh, the cognitive approach assumes that people have a limited set of core assumptions about the world of self and others, and that numerous peripheral beliefs derive from these core assumptions. These beliefs, core and peripheral, have action consequences. When the beliefs are disordered or out of touch with reality, psychopathological behavior may ensue. Thus, Alfred Adler, for Freud's first dissenting disciple and first modern cognitive psychologist, talked about the individual's private logic. Neurotic individuals, according to Adler, are neurotic because their private logic includes beliefs about the world, self, and others. For example, I must be perfect in all that I do. Some of you can relate to that, I'm sure. Uh, that, uh, that caused them to come into conflict with or withdraw from other people. According to Adler, the individual's faulty private logic develops not from how he or she handles childhood sexuality, as Freud maintained, but from how he or she handled the inferiority that is the natural condition of children. To Adler, the key factor in development is not that children are sexual, but that they are little and weak. Children's fundamental assumptions about world, self, and others develop from how they and their environments respond to the unavoidable starting condition of weakness and dependence. In normal development, little, weak children are typically raised in loving, secure homes that reward their small steps toward maturity, thereby enabling them to develop a healthy self-esteem and learn how to manage in the social world that all the hermits inhabit. In neurotic development, children are typically raised in an emotionally stunted and psychologically unsafe home in which their small steps may be disparaged or ignored, causing them to develop assumptions about life that may lock them, for example, in defeatist attitudes, e.g. I am a loser and I will fail in all that I do, or pretentiously compensatory patterns, I must be perfect in all that I do. Needless to say, this is an overgeneralization. Some individuals can grow up in very uh, deprived environments and, and manage. There's always going to be individual variability, but all things being equal, it's better to grow up in a loving, safe home than an unloving, unsafe home. The important point to keep in mind is that our fundamental assumptions about life emerge in large part from our experience, not from our rational deliberations. I think one could actually argue that our rational deliberations reflect our experience psychologically more than the opposite. Modern cognitive therapists, though rarely acknowledging Adler, say much the same thing, only more systematically. Aaron Beck, the father of modern cognitive therapy, called the individual's core assumptions schemas. Albert Ellis, the dis unlikable founder of rational emotive therapy, <laughs> talks about the irrational assumptions that troubled people hold. Indeed, psychologists have even developed instruments for assessing the ways in which a person's thinking may be out of whack. One such measure, for example, is called the dysfunctional attitude scale. These, this whole approach sort of assumes that um, all is not equal. There are certain beliefs and assumptions about the world that enable us to adapt more effectively than other beliefs. And some beliefs, such as I must be perfect, have consequences that interfere with adaptation. Uh, and that we develop those assumptions through our individual experience. Uh, as children and as adults, it's not just as some orthodox Freudians maintain, it's just five years, but those first five years of life may create the templates through which we interpret future experiences and it can be, you can get into the feed of self-fulfilling, self, uh, uh, self-reinforcing patterns of behavior. 
cognitive therapists have discovered that they can more effectively help distressed people by teaching them how to recognize and challenge the core assumptions that generate conflict and how to try out and practice assumptions and behaviors that are likely to have more pleasant consequences. Hence the perfectionist operating on the assumption that I must be perfect in all that I do is tactfully guided, although in Albert Ellis's case he may be bluntly directed, to the realization that this belief is nuts, that it is completely inappropriate to the realities of the human condition. Uh, in other words, the cognitive therapist in essence says, hey buddy, you can't be perfect in all that you do, you know, it's time to join the human race. Uh, I summarizing in therapy, that's not what you do. You don't say, hey buddy, it's time to join the human race. You might if you're Albert Ellis. Uh, but there is a, there's a process whereby the therapist helps the person come to question these fundamental assumptions. And you may do that by looking at the conflicts currently in life and ultimately try to uncover the assumptions that are, that are underlying those conflicts. And then to try out new behaviors. Uh, and it's ultimately change comes from that. Uh, Making such fundamental changes in one's life doesn't result only from rational discussion, although this can be an important factor. The change results in large part from personal experience and the consequences of behaviors associated with other fundamental assumptions. However, tentatively and even reluctantly, these new behaviors may have been attempted, typically with the support and encouragement of the therapist. I think it was Jerome Frank, although I might be wrong on that, historically. He, coined the phrase corrective emotional experience in therapy, that through therapy one comes with the encouragement of the therapist to try out new behaviors. And these have emotional consequences as well as action consequences. And that if the therapist proceeding right, the, the one's assumptions about the world begins to change, begin to change and uh, one develops new patterns of behavior that with practice and with experience become more or less second nature. And that's really how the, the, the personality change can come about. Now what does all of this have to do with conversion? In conversion, as in cognitive therapy, a person's fundamental assumptions change and new behaviors consistent with the new assumptions are tried out and found to work, at least temporarily. Sometimes the convert, like the therapy client, is troubled and unhappy with how his or her life is going. But sometimes the convert's life is working just fine. What, what causes the change? <clears throat> There's no simple answer to this question because there are many types of conversion involving many types of people coming from many types of circumstances. Hence, in what follows, I make no claim to explain all conversions. I, I really hope to illuminate some. I believe that, as with the cognitive therapy client, Personal experiences, particularly compelling inner experiences, are often the dominant factor for changing fundamental assumptions. These inner experiences may be engineered, as is sometimes the case with certain large group awareness trainings, by the classic Mooney Boonville we get. Uh, in, in, in the large group awareness trainings, like SD and Granddaddy, all of those, the, the goal of the training is to help the person get it. And get it is defined, it's not defined, it's very ambiguous. You have to experience it. It can't be described, you have to experience it. And if you look at the training, you can analyze it as a program that is designed to induce an ex a very powerful and compelling experience for people who have gone through it uh, that causes them to question what the assumptions that they organized their life around in the past. <clears throat> Uh, the Mooney Boonville experience is also very programmed. It's, it's very deliberate. Uh, but it may be other experiences as well. So, for example, Sai Baba, the Indian guru who likes to materialize objects that are small enough to fit in his sleeves, can, <laughs> can, can, the skeptical inquirer has done an interesting expose of uh, him. Can cause someone to, cause, can cause jaws to drop, okay, that what's going on? This is uh, part of the rationale of what Sandy Endron's going to do later in his program of using magic to try to 
create the impression of having some power. When it's a magic show, you know it's a trick. When it's a guru, you might think that it's a miracle and that he has a special power. And the, ex the experience of seeing this kind of seemingly miraculous trick, if it is not perceived as a trick, but is perceived as real, can be very jarring to someone coming, for instance, from a typical Western secular perspective. You now begin to question the assumption that I'm only made of atoms and the void. And you think that, well, maybe, maybe there is a miraculous and this guy has it. And then you may, may uh, become a follower. I'll, I'll get into that a little bit more. Uh, these, uh, the, the, the leaders may sometimes, oh, I, I sort of said, yeah, so. Okay. Once such an experience, such as with the, the, the magical guru, uh, the large group awareness training, or it could be a, a Christian uh, uh, gathering, it's very emotional. Paul Martin has used the term the buzz to describe the experience of some people joining Christian fringe groups that are cultic. But there's a very uh, intense emotional experience that causes this jarring of one's fundamental assumptions. Once such experiences cause us to reorient or begin reorienting our fundamental assumptions, the natural human tendency to be logically consistent drives us over time also to reconsider and if necessary rearrange our peripheral beliefs and behaviors to make them more consistent with the new assumptions we are embracing. Such a process may be intellectually and emotionally challenging, so it is not surprising that we will reach out to others for support and guidance. In highly manipulative groups, somebody is always waiting in the wing to make sure that one draws the correct conclusions from the compelling experiences that elicited the reevaluation process. So if it's a large group awareness training, there's going to be someone waiting around to tell you about how important it is to take the next training. Uh, so that you can fully understand that. In the Moon Moonville experience, someone's there explaining to you that God is working for you, that he's calling you, and you've got to go to the seven-day workshop, and then the 14-day. So that the, 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 the individual is off balance, is reconsidering, and then the environment, if it is truly a manipulative environment, will try to direct him or her to the place that they want him or her to go to. Um, in less high-pressure, more ethical groups, members may encourage a prospective convert to think carefully about the new belief system in private and over a period of time. A Franciscan priest, for example, once told me that novices were encouraged to spend a year in the world before taking their vows in order to make sure that their vow taking truly reflected an inner calling and wasn't merely a superficial response to psychological needs. In my opinion, this time-out period is perhaps one of the most essential accountability mechanisms that can distinguish a legitimate religious group seeking change from a more manipulative kind of group. If the change that the group is advocating is really substantial and really has substance, it doesn't have to be done now. You can take time out and come back to it. And I think most mainstream religions Will, will do that. There will be a respect for the identity of the person and you will stand back and give him some, some room to and some space to make a personal decision rather than a pressure decision. Uh, personal experiences and the tendency to be logically consistent may also impel us to question our more recently embraced fundamental assumptions. In cultic groups, for example, it's not unusual for a person to go through the following stages. And I'm here just going to kind of summarize what I'm talking about and end with the person reevaluating the cultic mindset and coming out of it. <clears throat> and this is an oversimplification, admittedly, but you know, I think it might be a little more. The leader, one encounters a leader, he's perceived as having some special ability of charisma. He reads minds, he heals people, he induces altered states of consciousness in people. These experiences cause one to reconsider one's assumptions about the world, self, and others. The leader's minions, who become aware of one's openness to their belief system, will, frequently with much genuine concern and sincerity, do what they can to ensure that the prospective convert makes the correct interpretation of these experiences. 
the prospect comes to accept at least provisionally the fundamental assumptions, what I've elsewhere called the ruling propositions, on which the group is based. E.g., God is guru, guru is God incarnate, past the Bob is a modern day prophet, Sister Veronica is God's messenger. Whatever the assumption is, this is the ruling proposition that's going to rearrange other beliefs. The leader and our group thus comes to have come to have a high level of credibility and authority for the prospect. The prospective convert yields to these pressures, whether they be mild or strong, and reaches a point at which he or she declares, I believe. The initial declaration is usually directed at ruling propositions. See, I think the, 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 the first stage of conversion is to buy, is to accept the fundamental assumptions. And the person is not changed. The, the, the personality change occurs after that uh, reorientation to fundamental assumptions. The convert rearranges peripheral beliefs and behaviors to make them more consistent with the new set of assumptions and their derivative peripheral beliefs and behaviors, again frequently accompanied by varying degrees of social pressure and their guidance. The convert becomes comfortable with the new set of beliefs and behaviors. He or she is now a true member. The convert, now a member of the group, becomes aware of inconsistencies, contradictions, abuses, or failed predictions within the group or organization. This is where the cracks begin to arise within the cultic uh, mindset. Normal cognitive dissonance processes combined with group pressures cause the member to search for rationalizations to explain away these disturbing discrepancies. In the Women Under the Influence the book of the Cultic Studies Journal 14.1, there's a wonderful article by a collective of women who wrote anonymously that I think really uh, illuminates the ways in which the convert becomes a in a sense, a collaborator in his own deception, in his own conversion, that this tendency to be rational and, and logical causes the person to seek for the rationalizations to justify the, the, the behaviors that are causing him harm. So if Guru is sleeping with some women in the group, he's doing it to help them uh, overcome their sexual karma, not because he's attached to sex, because he's perfect and, and he's, he's, he's beyond all of that. So that the cult member himself will rationalize the behavior. That the Guru doesn't have to micromanage, so to speak, the psychological processes of the convert if he has succeeded in changing the fundamental assumptions. Um, I'm just about to finish up. Okay, and so many disturbing discrepancies accumulate that, as one ex-member put it, the shelf of rationalization on which they were placed collapses. You know, you reach a point where the, the individual cannot no longer tolerate the, the inconsistencies within his or her own mind. Uh, and that's, that's when the reevaluation of the group begins. And then, the, and this again is the same process. The member once again begins to reconsider fundamental assumptions. Only this time, he or she reconsiders the assumptions, the ruling propositions of the group to which he had, had claimed allegiance sometimes for many years. And the, if, if, to relate this to practical concerns, if that person's family had been prepared properly, the family will be able to help that person make a smoother transition. Sometimes people will come out of groups totally confused, you know, not knowing and having no, no confidence in themselves, no confidence in their guru anymore, and just sort of floating in, in, a, in a space of absolute uncertainty about life. And they may be right to being uh, manipulated by someone else who might come along. So you'll get a lot of different reactions. But the fundamental process is that the assumptions get changed and we change our behaviors and beliefs to be consistent with those assumptions. If they don't work for us in life, at some point they may be questioned again. And the next speakers will, will give some personal anecdotes and experiences that I hope will illuminate some of what I talked about. Thank you. I'm going to help, help concepts create the context for our experience. The concepts of one group at one, one point in time, and that would be Transcendental Meditation, looking at some of their video materials that they from, use to promote their university. And by, by using these materials, we'd like to share with you some of what we saw when we first encountered this group in 1974-75.
So in the first two weeks, it's 86, 87. So it's not hard. <laughs> Can you turn the lights down a little bit back there? I'll give you the video cut. These pictures that you're looking at, you're going to see two domes. And these domes are domes where people levitate twice a day to help save the world. And so they're inside the domes right now. And to provide the foundation for success and fulfillment in life, and they want the best. At Maharishi International University, students gain a level of academic excellence and quality of life that is not available at any other university in the world today. MIU, which has its central campus in Fairfield, Iowa, USA, is an independent, non-sectarian institution. MIU is the first university to offer an education based on the knowledge and direct experience of the unified field. I absolutely love my classes. I find them so fulfilling because my mind and my heart both expand. And both expand every day. So every day seems fresh and new. And because you feel so good about yourself and your mind expands every day, you can just take in so much more knowledge. MIU was founded in 1971 by Maharishi Mahesh Yogi who is internationally known and respected as the foremost scientist and teacher in the field of consciousness. <laughs> Students at MIU gain the best in traditional knowledge and at the same time develop their creative genius through the Maharishi technology of the unified field. This integrated education prepares students for greatness in their professions and personal lives. The reason I chose MIU was because of my friends, really. I saw what kind of people were coming from MIU. I saw what people were graduating, and they were dynamic, and they were happy, and they were well-educated, and they were... I wanted that in my life, and that's really the thing that sold me on MIU. MIU is accredited by the North Central Association of Colleges and Schools. MIU offers degrees in the most important modern disciplines in the arts, sciences, and humanities, including 11 undergraduate majors, 11 master's programs, and four doctoral programs. Students come to MIU from over 50 different countries. I wanted education, but I also wanted fullness within myself, you know, my own personality. I wanted to see grow. And I think that's what I've experienced here, you know, especially in terms of inter, you know, interpersonal relations. I mean, I've never really had the experience to, to be on such good terms with so many people. At MIU, students enjoy an ideal environment for learning and for personal growth. The students at MIU are extremely creative. They're always looking at old ideas in a new light. So the other thing they do is more creative, more exciting, more innovative. But the students just have that extra energy and creativity from, from practicing the Marshy technology the unified field. And they bring that energy and creativity into all aspects of their life. Okay, translation, Maharishi technology of the unified field means levitation. <laughs> the source of all creativity and orderliness in the universe. For thousands of years, Vedic science, the most ancient tradition of knowledge, has preserved the complete understanding of the unified field. Today, modern physics has located this ultimate reality. Progress in physics during the past 10 years 
This is the founder of the Natural Law Party, the fourth largest political party in the United States, fourth largest recipient of federal funds in the United States for a political party. John Hagelin. Simpler and more unified understanding of the laws of nature. And this has culminated in the discovery of completely unified field theories. Dr. John Hagelin, who has been a leading researcher at the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center and at CERN in Switzerland, is a highly regarded authority in the area of unified quantum field theories. This means that the different forces responsible for all activity in the universe, such as the electromagnetic force responsible for light and radio waves, and gravity responsible for the gravitational force, all these superficially diverse phenomena are in fact the expressions of a single underlying field. One field whose excitations comprise all types of matter and energy in the universe. Physics has glimpsed the unified field, but it has no method to directly experience it. In Vedic science, Maharishi has rediscovered techniques that enable the human nervous system to actually experience the unified field. It's possible to experience the unified field directly through a technology that expands comprehension. The Maharshi technology of the unified field expands human comprehension so that more fundamental and more unified levels of natural law can be comprehended and experienced by the individual. This new technology can be easily learned by anyone. It involves no faith, belief, or philosophy. As part of their academic routine, MIU students practice the Maharishi technology of the unified field daily, including the Transcendental Meditation and TM City program. The TM technique is a simple, natural procedure that allows the mind to settle down to the least excited state of human consciousness, where it's identified with the unified field. The TM City program trains the mind to function from the unified field. The faculty and founder of MIU believe that the purpose of a university is the creation of new knowledge. And not only new knowledge, but new knowledge at the frontiers of knowledge where knowledge is most significant, most profound, and most powerful for the betterment of society. At this time of history, it's clear that the frontier of knowledge is the unified field of all the laws of nature. The unified field is ultimately the basis of all knowledge. To illustrate this, the MIU faculty... <laughs> So we've looked at some context that's created to bring about experience. And can people come up with some of the things from this recruiting tape um, that help shape people's experience? Do you have any ideas of the kind of things that might happen internally in people? The community aspect is um, stressed heavily. Community? The personal relationships. And then there's this theory that's presented. The theory is that there's this unified field of all the laws of nature. The, this, this, this theory can be proven true if one does these techniques. And the, the most powerful way of knowing it's true, that the theory is true, is that if you do a particular technique, you'll levitate. And so in the, the Golden Domes of Pure Knowledge, um, for a few people here spend a lot of time, um, <laughs> People, for about two and a half hours every morning, two and a half hours every evening, practice this technology. This one. Signals. <laughs> so they practice this technology. Not, not only in, in this context. Now standing. Uh, podium, uh, podium. Is floating next? Floating. <laughs> And said, yes. um, not only at this uh, school, but the government of Mozambique has trained its entire military in this technology because what they believe is that it has an effect upon lowering crime and stopping war. Also, the government of the Philippines sold the largest university in Asia at one time from our issue, uh, the University of the East, for training people in this technology. The government of Zambia and Africa. Uh, gave a quarter of the country to Maharishi to train people in this technology. Based upon people having internal experiences that it's true, that's right. And so one of the things we want to do is we want to look at some of the information about levitation and show you what it looks like. Um, 
Before that, I'd, I'd like to talk a little bit about my personal experience in relationship to TM and in relationship to TM and my own internal experience. Uh, one of the first things that, that I remember when I was looking to TM as a technique to help me improve my studies was the wonderful diagrams that they showed us, all seemingly scientific. That was the draw. That was the initial impulse for me to get involved in a system. At the time, I wasn't looking to be converted to anything. I wasn't even, at least I didn't think I was looking, for a new belief system. Yet, two years later, I was what could be classified as a dyed-in-the-wool Hindu. Now, how does that transition take place from believing that you know Jesus Christ was, uh, was my savior to believing that I was somehow feeding the gods a substance called Soma, which was then allowing the gods to, to be more, more powerful and therefore able, able to create boons for not only myself, but for society at large in a two-year time. Now, this is a scientifically verified system theoretically, <laughs> that, that has nothing to do with any kind of sectarian belief, yet there had been a shift that had taken place. And that shift was a result of internal experience. The internal experience that was generated by the practice of transcendental meditation. And that practice included certain mantras, which are drawn from the Hindu system. And those mantras were never to be spoken aloud. So my mantra, Ayin, that was never to, be that never to be spoken aloud. That was my mantra. I predict that you were 19, 20, 21, somewhere in there when you learned the practice. That, that mystical system was something that was developed early on, and it was a real simple system, and everyone's mantra was picked by age or by age and sex. So they had a few different criteria that was given out in various different teacher training courses. And internal experience was, was a thing that dominated in, within the system. We were told to look at our own subjective experience in order to validate the reality of things that were discussed within the TM system. And when I got involved in 1975, the, the idea of quantum physics and the theory of a unified, unified field was something, it, it still is basically a theory because it hasn't been proven, no one's touched the unified field, and yet we were made to believe that it was one and the same that our internal experience state, which Maharishi described way back in 1964 as being, was precisely the same as what was discussed by various upper level physicists, quantum physicists, as the unified field. So, Can I make a sure. Just for clarity, I think it's important to make a distinction between the pitch and the experience. What you saw was the sales pitch. That's appealing to certain currents that uh, uh, were popular within the culture at the time. This is a culture that prides itself on being rational and scientific, so they use science, they use scientific terms. You'll see this in other groups. There's one group that uh, believes it has the power of uh, giving people physiological immortality, and they, they, they're fond of RNA and uh, you know all kinds of biological terms. And they're really taking advantage of the basic in scientific illiteracy of the average person in the scientific culture. Uh, and I think this tape does much the same thing. But that's what gets the person's interest. That's what gets him to open up to hear a little bit more. And I think where you're going is how the next step is how you're, in a sense, um, jostled internally because of the experiences which increases the credibility of the people who gave the sales pitch. M Michael said in his book, the beginning part, that conversion happens after the acceptance of some fundamental assumptions. And it's very interesting in this context, at this university, people spend, they go ac have academic information for about two months, and then they spend a month, which is called Forest Academy, where they study going more internal, they do a lot more meditation. And every one of these months, sort of internal months, have themes. And the first theme of the first month 
is a Sanskrit concept uh, coming from the Bhagavad Gita, and it's called knowledge is structured in consciousness. Knowledge is different in different states of con consciousness. What such essentially it means is that if you're uh, in a village and there's a mountain, and, and this is how it's explained, and, and you, there's a valley on each side, if you're sitting at the bottom of the mountain, you can only have so much information about the valley. But as one climbs the mountain, one has a little bit more knowledge of the valley. And if you're at the top of the mountain, you can see all around. The guru is at the top of the mountain, <laughs> guiding the aspirant up every step of the way and taking away obstacles along the way. That creates a certain indebtedness to the path, to the system, and to the, to the teacher, whoever that may be. And, and, and in this month course, the entire month is drilling on this one point that there can be, that this per, a perfected being could be made, that there can be someone who can achieve that. And when you make that connection that, oh, Maharishi has achieved that, thus everything he says is correct, that everything flows. And it was always amazing to me because new students would come to the university who were like me, 17, you know, for you know, had a good time. And then they would go to Forest Academy, and when they would come out, they would be wearing their white shirts, red ties, blue suits, and they were in line. And it would happen all the time. And the new students would come the next quarter, and they would be wild and say, oh, just wait till they have their first Forest Academy. Because as soon as they had their first Forest Academy, they'd come out in line. Not one for one, but in the main. We just interrupted. Right. <laughs> so, it, I, I came to the to this system with a belief. I was raised Roman Catholic, and and I knew from the time I was a child that there were these mystical states. All as I had to hear was that there was some connection between the kinds of things that Saint Teresa Avila talked about and Saint John of the Cross talked about and this unified field-based civilization. Now, it was all tied up in a neat package. I could experience the same things by only plunking down $65 as a student and beginning to learn my meditation. Wow, this was easy. You know, this whole idea in, in Christianity of via negativa, where you had to deny yourself. Maharishi was all about not, no denial. So it, it created both a desire and my pre-orientation coming to a system with certain concepts about what mysticism would be like or what would, would theoretically look like were things that, that I sort of brought to the table when I first uh, encountered TM. Now, they made efforts to stay away from all of the mystical sounding or religious sounding notions about spirituality and made every attempt to, to bring us to speak about it in terms of science because that was something that could be considered objective and therefore not questioned by the larger community. So it was a very effective recruiting mechanism. When we look at John Hagelin, now here's the, what, this, what people would consider to be a genius, you know, in, in a certain field of science, yet he's able to rope off or cordon off a part of his thinking in relationship to Maharishi and his, his quotations about the unified field and what he probably really knows about it in the physical sciences. So how does that take place? And again, we get back to a repetition of certain rituals, which in TM would be the encouragement to meditate 20 minutes twice a day, never missing, because it could create a real serious problem in your psychology when you get habituated to the practice. And if you stop, you may actually step back further than when you began. So the tendency is never to miss. In fact, I can go back and think, you know, in my nine and a half years of involvement in the system, maybe once or twice in that time, I missed meditation. The demand for, for more meditation was something that came as, as time progressed. The product became refined, and by the product I mean the programs that Maharishi was selling. He then introduced this idea of levitation. Hey, who doesn't want to levitate? You know, gravity is, is, is a fundamental thing that we struggle with every day, right? Well, Maharishi said, no need to struggle. You know, I'll give you an opportunity to experience life free of physical boundaries. So a demonstration of that was the levitation exercise. And what did that feel like? Well, when, and, and this is where I, I feel expectancy 
really enters into the picture, the idea of how, how the context of the group allowed us to expect certain results from levitation. You'll talk to certain people who practice TM or currently members and they'll say, I levitated, absolutely. And you know, there'll be a certain congruence with the way they're speaking about it. They're not lying. They believe, by definition, of what that was given to them by the TM movement, that this is levitation. When actually I knew it to be a physical exercise that was somewhat motivated by an internal experience of, of a shaking associated with um, with certain inner experiences. So the inner experience would be a shaking, a kind of jolt in the, what would feel like a jolt in, in the nervous system, and then you would move off the phone. The way they describe it is, we sit quietly, and then we lightly lift off and come back down again. <laughs> As we practice more, we will experience more. We will be able to stay up longer. Well, that was a promise in 1975, and if you look today, they're still doing the exact same hopping <laughs> as they did no, then. No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's important for, for people to see, you know, the kind of things that we saw in preparation for us to experience this levitation technique. Well, sure. Before we uh, show the, a video of levitation, I think it's important for people to know how we learned this and how special we were for learning this, this technique. We have this expectation that people are going to fly, so much so that they actually had ported foams, because you have to fly in foam rubber when you, when you land, and you know, sometimes it hurts. And they had quarter foams that you could tie yourself into these cushions, and I knew that I'd be flying down I-75 back to Florida, <laughs> and I need to foam occasionally on the way home. Margie was on the TV station in Southern California that the TM women owned, and he was on it, and he said that, you know, no need for taxi cabs. People would be hovering above taxi cabs. So we knew this was going to happen. But when we went to learn to fly, in my case, it was a three-month-long course. Um, after having done a lot of preparation and a lot of screening of uh, moving out of the people who would not play with the game, so to speak, in which we were given badges. The badge had the corporate seal of the TM movement on it and our picture. And when the day came for us to learn to fly, and for the entire room, three months before that, we were brought into a room that had a set of double doors. And on each side of the double doors was somebody I knew who checked my badge to make sure that I was who I said I was. Because this is the secrets of the universe, and the CIA, and the KGB, and everyone else wants to know this knowledge. <laughs> and after I passed through the first set of double doors, there was another set of people, who I knew, I've known them for a few years, who checked my badge, to make sure I was who I said I was. Then I went and sat in a row, a signed seat, and the rows were of six people. A row here of six people, a row here of six people, a row here of six people. And the first person in the, in the, in the head of the row was the group leader. And they asked for the group leaders to check everyone's badge in their group. <laughs> of which I knew all six people. For a few years, they checked my badge. Then they said, with the person to the right of you and to the left of you, check the person's badge. To make sure they were there, they, who they are. And these are also people, but in different groups, who I knew for a couple of years. They checked their badge. Then, people I didn't know came in with books. And each page of the book had a picture, six pictures. They checked to make sure I was who I said I was. And then a second set of people came in. I, I should say that it was you needed more pictures to get your TM flying badge than you do to get a U.S. passport. <laughs> well, then a second set of people came through with another set book and checked our pictures. Of course, the room was locked. And at which point, they then came through with suitcases and put down wires down the aisles with little earphones because we had to learn this in our ear because people would be listening from the outside. Of course, all the little wires created a big antenna, so it would have been very easy. We were brought to the front room where a ceremony was done, brought back to our chairs, which again, we had to have a, another group security check to make sure we, we said we were. At which time, the day came when Margie said, so, the words I remember them very clearly on a videotape, so you want to learn to fly. <laughs> you are seated on the phone, and I looked around, no, we're not on the phone, they've got it wrong. <laughs> because the phone was in our door. But we, we, 
when we learned this technique, and he said to repeat this phrase, uh, relationship of body and akasha, lightness of cotton fiber, every 15 seconds, and we would fly. So now we can look at people flying, and there'll be no laughing at this. <laughs> now I'll say that because I was with a, a younger group of people and uh, we weren't too good with the pests at following all the rules, when we learned and we went back to our dorm to get on the phone, nothing happened. And oh. then we realized that was because we had ordered pizza two months earlier one night and pizza wasn't on the program. <laughs> we were supposed to eat pizza and maybe it was the popcorn we ate. And maybe it was because I didn't go to bed at exactly at 10. I went to bed at 10.01 one night. And, and I was the first person in my small group to levitate, which shocked me as much as it did everyone else. <laughs> And I was just, I realized just how, what a good, if not accepted I was. How open to suggestion I was, in retrospect I'm talking now, not while I was involved in the group. And the people like Joe we call bliss ninnies. <laughs> the bliss ninnies were then sent in to be with us to, as they call it, create the popcorn effect. So that he would be in and somehow with our eyes closed we would see what he was doing and then we would start flying. He was a seed. Because the secrets to Doug Henning. This is Doug Henning, the magician who was on Broadway, the magic show. Uh, he just died recently of, of uh, liver cancer, unfortunately, at a very young age. Um, even though he was, he's a, what continued to be involved in a program to develop immortality amongst the populace. So, yeah, a little bit of popular dissonance there. <laughs> He's a master of illusions. Ladies and gentlemen, your host, Mr. Kennedy. I've had a question on my mind ever since I was six years old. I thought if anybody knows Maharishi knows, and I said, Maharishi, is there real magic? And he said, yes, if you want to learn real magic, come with me. And he got up and started, and I saw so he got up and I started to follow him. And then somebody grabbed me and said, you can't go with him, you've got a show tonight on Broadway. And I said, oh yes. But ultimately, the magician did arrange to follow Maharishi. First to India, then Switzerland, and finally to Holland. This is where the Maharishi lives. It's one of a number of colleges he's established around the world to promote his teachings and to give his movement academic credibility. Maharishi's philosophy dominates all thinking in these institutions. His semi-mystical, scientific-sounding theories have expanded to produce a master plan to create heaven on earth. The early steps to heaven include vegetarianism and a strict behavior code. Blue jeans won't make it. An executive dress is required for public appearances. Doug Henning follows all the rules as the star disciple of Maharishi. He said the real magic is your own consciousness. He said you're only using a little bit of your consciousness. If you expand your consciousness infinitely, then nothing is impossible. And I said, can we fly? And he said, yes. Can we walk through walls? And he said, of course. And he explained to me how this is possible because when you experience pure consciousness, then you become the laws of nature and you can control them. And this is the absolute truth. And a lot of people listening to me saying this will say, that's not possible, but it is possible. Maharishi defines reality for TMers. These advanced meditators believe they are about to fly because Maharishi tells them so. You saw what happened when they start shaking like that? Yes. What's interesting is when we talk about these internal experiences, this is one of the things that made me know that this was probably accurate. Even after I left the movement, because what I would start having this energy going through my body. And you saw that, where the person started shaking like that. It still happens now, 25 years later. Now, it's no big deal, it doesn't bother me at all. 
but it was something that made me make sure this must be, must be true because I, I'm feeling this energy. It's starting to happen. And I was like always wondering what, you know, what was bringing this about. And it would happen at inappropriate times. In movie theaters, at <laughs> dinner table with my parents. You know, not, not always the best places for it to happen. And I remember going out and working with Dr. Margaret Singer at her house. And she spent about a half hour and then we figured out what was causing this with me. And what was causing it was that when you're in this flying room, there's a lot of people, there's actually, there's flying lanes, there's the fast lane, the slow lane, and people are like, making the sound. And unconsciously, I wired up or married the sound of a sigh with this energy going up, with all the suggestions of the energy. So all that hap would happen was in a room like this, someone would sigh and the energy would start going. And just learning that, intellectually understanding, I started seeing how I was wired up. How these experiences were brought about that married me to this conversion. Let me look a little bit more of it. Ten years ago, Maharishi added yogic flying to the most advanced and expensive meditation courses. Of course, the idea of flying for real mesmerized Doug Henning. I do it every morning and every evening. I never miss doing it because I look forward to it as I'm working. I think, oh, I'm getting a little tired. I can hardly wait to go in and jump on those bats and get rid of that stress. So it's a really, really beautiful thing, and uh, it's a great gift that Maharishi brought the world. It also, Maharishi says, contributes to world peace. Group flying and group meditation create what he calls the Maharishi effect. Maharishi flyers love to get hot. It seems to start off flying like a bird to the air, although it come down immediately. But the inner uh, experience is one of, um, like I, I clearly perceive that I don't only have a mind and I have a body, but I also have a soul. It's absolutely, it's, there is, I mean, we could describe it in many different ways, but the one thing personally I feel the most is this bubbling bliss going through the whole physiology, through your own mind, and you just feel totally free and totally happy. It's absolutely a wonderful experience. And this is, by the way, okay. So, what, what they were able to deliver or offer us were altered states, a, a, a methodology for altering our consciousness. The promise was that something, in some way, somehow these altered states would relate to a better life. But what we found, at least a few of us, many actually, who left the movement over time, was that there was some inconsistency. And that process of, of evaluating my experience happened at a, one of the largest courses that TM had ever held up to that point. It was uh, 1979, I believe, in Amherst, Massachusetts. It was the first World Peace Assembly where there would be a gathering of 3,500 yogic flyers together to generate a huge wave of coherence, as they refer to it, in world consciousness. It was 1978, the year of invincibility for all nations. Thank you for the correction. 1978, the year of invincibility. <laughs> so, so while there, I happened to, to go. I, I, I actually got sick, which wasn't supposed to happen on a you know a course for immortality and perfect health. Uh, I actually got some kind of back. There was a bacteria in the uh, uh, ventilation system that a lot of people ended up getting sick. So I was in my room and I picked up a book by C.S. Lewis called The Screw Tape Letters. And it was while reading that book that I began to get, I guess, fright would be the word I, I described, and began to be able to reflect on my experience in relationship to what C.S. Lewis was writing about, a, a world movement. I believe he was writing about fascism at the time, but I began to see the TM movement in those writings. And so, I was actually somewhat shocked, and, and I couldn't give myself over to the movement and take it as seriously from that point forward, even though I was still a committed member. Because my experience up to that point had told me that once with the spiritual master, once the master has found you, there's no, no need to go back, or, or there's really going to be there's always going to be uh, barriers along the way, challenges that we have to overcome. And as you ascend more on the path, 
there's always going to be a, a more deep challenge. And th these were actually in intellectual challenges where my experience was still fairly good by movement standards. In fact, while I was there on that course, somebody came up to me and said, you know, Joe, I wasn't sure I believed in any of this levitation stuff. And yet he was here on the, there on the course hoping to achieve something that would convince him. When I saw you levitating in the flying room, I was convinced. And that puzzled me because internally, it didn't feel like anything extraordinary to me. And, and the gains that I hoped to get while, and, and that were promised in the system, Weren't, weren't there. In fact, I was experiencing quite the opposite. As a result of the increased meditation, I began to experience more mood swings in my life outside of meditation. <clears throat> I began to experience more uh, unevenness in temperament, which is something people always said, oh, wow, you're so even, you know, you're, you're able to you know, withstand certain things. And yet, that was shifting. There was actually a change of personality taking place at that point. So experientially, uh, again, the, the idea was that to expand one's knowledge, one expands internal and subjective experience, not looking really for validation outside or the rationalizations about, you know, concerning one's external or objective ex reality or something that were an everyday reality within the TM system. Yeah. My experience was a little, a little different than Joe. I didn't look like I was flying, but I felt like I was flying. <laughs> and, and I think that's because Joe was very thin at the time and very light. And actually, after he, he, he Mars, she gave him a gift of some money after he was dealing with the federal court. Uh, he went to a, a personal trainer. And the exercise that you do on your legs like this, there's sort of some relationship to the amount of weight you can lift with the rear of your leg. So eight, if you do 60 in the front, it's 80 in the rear. And Joe is the opposite. And, and actually, my, the trainer was a, a rower who said to me, how is this possible? What were you doing? <laughs> <laughs> and we always talk about how does the ex-member explain? <laughs> So I kind of got around by saying, well, I practiced yoga. <laughs> and you know, said something, you know, yoga is innocuous and you know, people uh, can practice it for any number of reasons and have no, no harm or anything. So that kind of satisfied that. But it was kind of embarrassing when I thought about the fact that here was a supernatural uh, technique that was supposed to spontaneously create this levitating reality when in, re when, when in reality it was all physical. For joke. <laughs> and and, and the, the group that I was with when we learned to fly, after about you know, five days of practicing this technique and nothing happening, all of a sudden one day you know, the lightning went off and the body started banging up and down, people started screaming, ranting, raving, rolling around on the floor. It was a little, a little bit of a cross between the invasion of the body snatchers and the exorcist too. But, I had experience, so although I wasn't flying, I saw people fly. Yeah. So when you're in this flying room, there's all this ex expectation about people flying. There was a Nobel Prize winner in the flying room with me, uh, Brian Josephson, the Josephson Effect, or tu and Tunneling in Physics. Um, you know, there were people, and he was saying we could fly, and I began to see people fly. I saw people go up in the air, and, and I thought that before they came down, there was a little hesitation. And that's what they were described. Did you notice the hesitation when Frank flew? He and started he coming down, but he went back up again a little bit. <laughs> and the fact is, that's part of my memory. I saw that. It's a, a memory of an event that didn't happen, but it's part of my memory. And what I find interesting when we work with people who are TM who fly, and we show them these tapes, they actually see people doing that. They see people going up, and hesitating, or going a little higher, and then coming down. That's what they see. And when you see it, probably no one saw that. But that's their experience. <laughs> and I always found that fascinating, to the point where I actually have a copy of this video slowed down frame by frame by frame, so that they can see that no one's going back up in the air. <laughs> but the, 
context that people are in can really shape one's experience and create quite different experiences with individuals. But the end result is we're all still on the same path. We all still believe the teacher is the teacher. And this is what we need to do to get along the way. And, and I think it's just a demonstration of how a, a, a leader can create a context and that context becomes your internal reality and therefore the validation for your purpose. Your purpose to maintain allegiance to the system, even at the expense of objective reality, which doesn't always agree. And in the case of levitation, I think most of us here would agree that we're not levit seeing levitation here at all. Yet, you know, the probably 100,000 people who've plunked down their $5,000 for this practice <coughs> really believe that there's something supernatural happening, happening here. And when you hear Doug Henning, you know, from his heart saying, and this is the gratitude that we all, that we, we have from our Rishi is a result of him giving us this precious knowledge, the treasure chest of mystical experience that Marishi has the key to. And that creates that desire, the need to stay within the system and not look from the outside in in order to validate in 7475. There were millions of people learning to meditate. The recruitment, but you know, what appealed to me was that my grades would improve, that I'd be able to run faster, and so you know, really learning how to levitate was not on the top of my list. I just wanted to go from a B to an A, or from a C to a, from from a yeah, from a C to an A, <laughs> average. And and interestingly enough, I did, and I credit that not with TM, but with the fact that I had been involved with some. Uh, pot smoking, as many of my friends had. Just videotape on, Joe. <laughs> and, and so, but, but it did give me a, a place where I, I found a social network of other people who had also, you know, gotten involved, gotten involved in stopping smoking pot. So, you know, there was some positive gain in that. But the appeal is often, you know, to uh, to things that can be scientifically validated. And that's what TM really appeals to, the idea that your educational performance improves, your athletic performance improves. In fact, every part of the area of your life will improve. <laughs> if only you, you learn to meditate. That's part of the pitch. I'm told we had a little technical glitch and the video turned off, so I was instructed to repeat the question, which was, you know, I forget. <laughs> Something about recruitment. Negative improvement and negative shot and negative effect. Okay. And TM helps with memory also. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> TM is, is, is promoted as a solution to all problems. So you can choose any area of life and it solves it. It doesn't matter what it is. Because it's a, you know, it touches into that unified field from which all creation springs. Neat, huh? <laughs> Well, that's also the way Scientology sees itself. Well, With the improvement, and you know, you come in and you take the courses, you in, improve your initial same pitch. Initial gains are not uncommon for people because the, the right. introductory programs often have things that are, that are either common sense or you know, they're workshops that are very fundamental and will work. So that's an often that, that's a way that people often enter into the system and they report, you know, I really can communicate better. Uh, you know, I really am calmer. But taking that leap from being, you know, a little calmer, uh, a little more focused in, in your life and better able to communicate to being able to save the world by virtue of closing your eyes and thinking, oh, that's a big jump. <laughs> but we got there. We uh, were describing here a sort of an advanced level of TM. Most people who go into TM just learn a basic technique and leave. They're not involved in the level that we were involved in. But from the very beginning, fundamental changes, uh, you have to accept fundamental assumptions, and there's fundamental changes in your assumptions about certain ideas. Uh, one in particular is when you learn, the day you learn to meditate, you fill out a form, simple form, that asks you questions about your experience when you learn. The second day when you come back to the, lecture, the second lecture, there's a form that has questions on it. The questions are slightly different. And the questions will say, the idea is that you're able to reach this fundamental state, this transcendental state. And it will say, how many times did it occur? So it's phrased in a, in a statement. It says, how many times did it occur that you were without thoughts and mantra? 
because that means you've transcended. So they're telling you that when you get your eyes closed and you're repeating the word, if you stop repeating the word, you're now in the transcendental state. So they're starting to shape and, and define what your experience is with just a subtle use of language. Okay, some more questions. Um, it's hard to pick. Uh, I think this lady had her hand up. Are you ready here? Me? <laughs> what, when, when each of you decided to leave, were you able to just walk away or? It was a few the, 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 the question is when they were decided to leave, were they able to just walk away or what? It was different for each of us, of course. Um, I had gotten involved in a legal suit against Transcendental Meditation, but I should mention that I, I had gotten involved in another Eastern group. And so some referred to it as the Gore Wars at the time because they were two individuals who knew one another back in India, and yet I had aligned myself with Guru 2 when Guru 1 was I knew to be evil, Guru 2 was cool, you know, he was good. So, um, in that process of, of um, litigating against Guru 1, I began to hear theories about thought reform, mind control, undue influence by attending the CAN conference. In fact, the teacher that I was associated with encouraged me to go to conferences because my attorney, who was very wise, suggested that I'd be able to articulate a very unusual experience. And the way to do that would be to sit with other people who've been through similar experiences. And so what that, in effect, did was begin my process of getting out of the belief system. So, with, But it was a slow process. It was, I was still in the group for two and a half years, having heard about you know, undue influence and, and how your environment can create your reality and things like that before I actually left. Right here. Thank you. Um, in, in our ashram, our guru taught us that all that hopping was just the fact that you guys were not as developed and you didn't have to <laughs> control and, and use the kundalini to actually have a spiritual experience. Right. Could you respond to that? The comment was that in her group, the guru said that the hopping indicated the lack of spiritual development. I think that's correct. <laughs> That there are three stages of flying. The first stage of flying is the body shakes. The second one, and this comes from the Shiva Purana, so the, the scripture in, uh, in, from India. The second stage is the body hops like a frog. And the third stage is it floats through the air. And so what we have to do is purify not the energy in our body, Kundalini. But that's an interesting subject you brought up, the concept of Kundalini, because when we talk about our experiences in groups, if the group, the system you're involved in, describes Kundalini uh, moving through the energy centers of the body and says there's seven energy centers, that's how you'll experience the concept called Kundalini. If the group or the system says that Kundalini rises from the base of the spine and moves up the front of the body and down the back of the body, that's how you'll experience Kundalini. If you're in a system that says it comes from the back of the, of the spine and up the back, that's how you experience Kundalini. And if it says it comes from above and comes down, that's how you experience Kundalini. So the question becomes, does experience itself, is that the, the way you judge a system? Is that because, the sole measure? Is, that, is the sole measure? Because experience is very easy to give to people. It's very easy to, to create these like signposts that says you're on, on the path, you're on the way. The second part of this question, I have a real need to discuss this because outside of the cult, um, I had left because I did have see a lot of abuse going on uh, during a period of time. And uh, at that time I had no support system, no family support, no friends. I uh, became clinically depressed, lost 30 pounds, couldn't sleep, but I, I was having a really difficult time. Um, this went on for probably six months. Uh, and I decided one day um, to sit and meditate. I hadn't been meditating during that period. And, um, and during that process, I had a Kundalini experience, but it wasn't hopping. I mean, I've had, I've had many other Kundalini experiences, but during this process, the thing that happened for me that surprised me, and I, I told my therapist about this, she didn't know what to make of it, 
if I'm talking about, and I had been suffering from chronic depression since I was a child. No medication, no drugs. I'm sitting in meditation, and during the process, this energy is just roaring, rushing up my body, and it forced my body to be stiff and straight. And I'm sitting there, and suddenly I experienced, uh, it was as if the knots of all the suffering and confusion in me untangled. And at that moment, it was as if I'd been in darkness or depression, and the light turned on and, and the depression started to lift over the next couple of days. And to me, it, it was it was God. It was my personal experience with them. I don't experience that as a manipulation. It saved my life. I had a need to discuss that with someone. I'm confused. I see manipulation, but I've also had some deeply personal conversion experiences. I'm confused, very much confused. Uh, the, the, the comment is a description of, uh, of a very compelling personal experience of the energy. Of sitting alone. Sitting alone. Not, in, not part of the not, not a group context that relieved the depression. And I think what the comment gets to is one of the most intriguing aspects of this whole phenomenon, which is that there are experiences that people will uh, explain in spiritual terms. Uh, and the, the real challenge is the discernment issue. And even the discernment reflects the assumptions that you're making. If one is open to the notion of God and has an experience like that, uh, it's much easier to give it a religious explanation. Um, the fact that you were alone and there wasn't a group context of manipulation makes it easier for you personally, probably, to have that kind of explanation. Because if you've been manipulated before, at least now you know that there's no one telling you how to interpret it. So there's a certain freedom in it. Someone else may have powerful experiences like that, but they're coming from a different standpoint and they may interpret it differently. Uh, and we don't really know. And I think each, each individual has to make a decision for himself. And this is the challenge uh, that, in a sense, this phenomenon presents to all of us. And socially, it becomes a question of how do we deal with other people who may have different interpretations than, than we do. Those things. Uh, and I think one of the differences in this environment is we try to encourage an openness to the fact that uh, people may have explanations that we disagree with. So an atheist might say, well, that's just because, you know, maybe it was because of certain chemicals in your blood and so on, and that it's an illusory experience. Someone who's coming from a religious framework may agree with you that that was the Holy Spirit working for you, or uh, uh, whatever. And if we can't really prove it, we can't at least respect each other. We don't have to agree in order to respect each other. So. Thank you. Um, this gentleman. Uh, Dr. Langoni, could you address the conversion process uh, for high demand groups that uh, often create lots of barriers to getting in? They're sort of hard to get. Uh, uh, you've got to study this and uh, uh, think about it and uh, uh, create a lot of barriers on the road to conversion and entry into the group. The, the, the question is, what do I think about groups that create barriers to conversion that have a lot of demands? Uh, I mean, my first reaction is good. Um, you know, I think there's less likelihood of being manipulated. It's not to say that you can't. I mean, it's, you can always have sort of a faint within a faint within a faint. I mean, it, it can always be a, a subtle manipulation. but. I think to the extent a religious organization encourages people to go slowly, to check things, uh, and the, the, they put obstacles like the Franciscan priests that said that they were told to go out of the world. And uh, Pat Joe have a friend who was in TN, who was a Jesuit, Benedictine. Benedictine, and he was told the same thing. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that the religious belief system is true but at least there's probably less likelihood that it's manipulative. I would also comment that um, if there are a lot of steps that one has to go through, there's probably going to be a screening process so that a lot of people aren't going to go 
for that trouble. It doesn't necessarily mean, though, that the end result is going to be good, because if you recall my uh, reference to Ben Zablocki's comment, the cultic system is defined more by the difficulty people have getting out, by the ways in which they get in. It's quite possible that you could have a group that has an entry system that is relatively benign, but once through the selective process people get into that system, it may still be a trap for them. Are we out of time? We're out of time, thank you.